mm. all the preparations. Mm. It's like taking off on a hang glider. Yeah. With all the preparations, you know, everything has to be straightened out. Well, if you want a definition of cybernetics, you can get it from Norbert Wiener, which is the study of communication and control in animals and the machine. But if you look at the history of cybernetics, uh, a very peculiar thing happened. Because after it became a discipline, which was after the Macy conferences in the 1940s, and Wiener had sort of was publishing his book, and with the help of Heinz and Warren McCulloch, uh, a discipline was founded. And because Wiener and also McCulloch had been working very much on the technological applications of cybernetics, which is circular reactions and feedback mechanisms and all that, for several years, cybernetics was concerned exclusively with technological applications. And you got all those wonderful things like uh, uh, automatic pilots and uh, goal-seeking missiles and all that. And they were fabulous technological advances. Now, Wiener and McCulloch and Heinz and several others at the beginning, had been very interested in the philosophical applications of cybernetics, but not very much was done about them early on. And that took until about, I think, the late 60s before uh, things like that came out. And that, if you like, then became the birth of second-order cybernetics, where the focus was no longer on a scientist doing things with things, but it was on the scientist himself. It, the beginning of that was a book that Heinz edited called Observing Systems. The focus was on systems that do the observing, and that do the thinking, and that do the exploiting and all that. So that was the second order cybernetics. Mm -hmm. That, I think, one has to know if you talk about cybernetics, because today the, the second field is as important as the first application. It's, it's the philosophical things that have slowly begun to influence other areas. It's a very slow process, and uh, part of that is because of the revolutionary ideas that are introduced by cybernetics into philosophy, which is all based on self-organization and the same things as the technological advances, but applied to intellectual proceeds and what not. Cybernetics has been defined since then in many different ways. I have my own definition, of which of course I'm fonder than of all the other definitions, and it is that cybernetics is the art of finding possibilities between constraints. I got to that definition originally because Gregory Bateson had written an article about evolution and the theory of evolution. And in that article, he had made very clear that the theory of evolution is not a causal theory, but it is a theory that works by constraints. And it was that that made me realize that indeed that seemed the most uh, salient characteristic of cybernetics, that it is interested in constraints and not in causes. Mm. And the interest in constraints means that you learn to sort of cope with constraints by finding other possibilities with, that don't conflict with the constraints. 
And that indeed is, is very much the picture of evolution, where those organisms survive that do not hit fatal obstacles during their existence. definition of cybernetics. I remember hearing it as the art and science of maintaining equilibrium in Very a good. world yes. of constraints and possibilities. Yes. I couldn't think of it yesterday. Well, I couldn't think of it either. So. <laughs> The, the notion of equilibrium, of course, comes directly from Piaget. And it's, uh, it's intimately connected with the notion of viability. Viability is whatever allows you to maintain your equilibrium. Well, it's very. Any time you try to go somewhere, any time you have a goal that you are pursuing, you go in a certain direction until you hit an obstacle. That obstacle shows you that the direction you've been going in so far is not a viable direction. It doesn't get you there. So you change your direction. And you try another direction. Try. Uh, turn to the left or to the right or whatever and you go until you meet another obstacle and so on until eventually hopefully you get close to your goal the viability is the ability of something that you're doing to get past the obstacles you do not do away with the obstacles but you go around them is viability similar to requisite variety? Mm, requisite variety was uh, Ross Ashby, Roger Conan's term. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, if you like, you need a requisite variety if you want to control something. So it's necessary for the for a viability for a viable control mechanism. Let me phrase this differently. If you want to build a mechanism that controls some process or some activity, the mechanism you build must at least have the same possibility of varieties of variability as the thing itself. That is the requisite variety that you can't control a process with something that is simpler than the process. It has to have the same um, possibilities of modification and the same flexibility, if you like. That, that was Ashby's principle of requisite variety. So maybe viability makes more sense when talking about second order cybernetics and requisite variety. Oh, absolutely. When talking yes. about first order yes. cybernetics. Yes. I'll tell you a, a, a very simple example of requisite variety yeah. is that if you have a light switch, the light switch has the necessary variety to switch the light on and off. But it cannot possibly alter the intensity of the light. If you want to do that, you have to add a resistance to the switch. And with that, you, exp you, uh, you uh, increase the, the varieties possible in the switch in order to control the varieties in what you're controlling. So requisite variety really has to do with, with controlled systems. Yes, absolutely. First order cybernetics is concerned with mechanisms that you are looking at, and that you are constructing, and that you are controlling. 
second order cybernetics is concerned with the constructor, the observer, and the controller. How do they manage to do it? And that is why second order cybernetics is interesting for cognition. First order cybernetics is not interesting for cognition. Yeah. And that gets me to something that has made me very unpopular in saying it, that most of what is called artificial intelligence today is based on first-order cybernetics. And therefore, it's very like behaviorism. It doesn't take into account what the intelligence has to do in order to observe, to construct, to think, to fantasize, and all that. My understanding is, is that that is exactly the split that happened in cybernetics. That you had cybernetics and then you had artificial intelligence, which was a continuation of first order cybernetics. Rather than in implementation yes. of. But let it be said that today, in, in the last, I would say, in the last 10 years, there have been people working in artificial intelligence who are more sophisticated than that who are getting round to the questions that you have to ask if you want to really model a living organism. Because the living organism is always the perceiver. The living organism is the one that constructs its own perceptions. And they're very often not like the one of the engineer who's trying to design the, uh, the automaton or the model or the robot. I don't want to devaluate first order cybernetics at all. I think some of the things that have come out of it are wonderful. Sure. And uh, we all know it. I, mean, I, I think they have it in refrigerators today. There are, um, there are chips that are implementations of first order cybernetics. In the cars today with all the automatic braking systems and all those, that's all first order cybernetics. But in order to get a driver of a car, you have to do a little more. You see, you have to get into the second order. Anything else you want to say about cybernetics? No, I think it's a widely abused term, you know. It's, uh, it's, it's become sort of cyber this, cyber that. And it, it's just, it's, uh, people try to sell things under that flag that have nothing to do with cybernetics at all. So. Mm -hmm.